So I'll talk about robustness and resilience, and if we have time at the end, about the link to efficiency. Um, so my name is Nick Friggins, um, and uh, as Jean-Baptiste said, I come from a, a research unit in Inha. I'll explain a little bit about that. Um, and most of the results I'm presenting today have been generated within an EU project called Gentor. Um, and I'll say a little bit about that as well. So my co-authors are all young scientists working within this EU project, Gentor. Um, so let me see. Is the screen moving for you? OK, it is now. OK, yep. So the unit I come from is called Mozart. Um, in French, that translates as systemic modeling applied to ruminants. So we do experimental work, but we have a core of work on a range of different types of models. Uh, so we have people who've, who've created uh, detailed physiological models, for example, of uh, reproductive hormonal profiles, where these models can generate this kind of behavior on a second by second basis. Um, we have models where we are looking at how animals respond to uh, challenges so their resilience, and obviously I'll come back on this later on in the talk. And at the other end of the scale, we have models, um, so up on the top left, which uh, are actually looking at what happens if you select animals in particular ways over 40 generations. So this is a farm level model running over 40 years. Um, and we also have had uh, various implications in precision livestock technology. So I was involved, for example, in the software for developing a system called Herd Navigator, which has been uh, commercialized by Dilabar. So we're very interested in trying to understand and then predict uh, how different biological systems work. I'm also the coordinator of this EU project, Gentor. Gentor stands for genomic management tools to optimize resilience and efficiency across the bovine sector. Um, if you look at the logo, it's not a transgenic cow, but it was merely to symbolize the fact that uh, we're looking both at the dairy side, so the females, but also at the beef side, so the males. And there is a website for Gentor, and I'm not going to go into the details of the project as such. What I will do, though, is just to say if, if I, the nub of what Gentor is trying to do is to seek to exploit the opportunities that are provided by, on the one hand, genomics and on the other hand, precision farming technologies. For us, these are highly complementary disciplines, adding precision where before it was lacking and they can be put together with strong synergy. Um, so an example of this, which is just coming out in the journal Animal, is a retooling of the RFI method for calculating efficiency to be used in the precision farming context. The Gentor website contains a range of uh, videos, um, so you can find an introduction to the Gentor project. You can also find uh, a more detailed discussion of this linkage between genomics and precision farming technologies. That's the talk on, on the far right there. And there are other videos. So without going into too much more detail, that is sort of the background for Gentor. But we can come now and talk about robustness and resilience. Um, these are terms we're hearing a lot in recent years. Reasonably easy to pin down and uh, in, in popular terms. I think we all know what we mean when we talk about a robust cow. Much harder to pin down in scientific terms. So this is in part because there are different usages of the terms robustness and resilience in different scientific disciplines. Um, for example, the definition which will be used by people looking at um, uh, agroecology and farm systems of resilience will not be the same as the definition that is used for describing a resilient animal. But this plethora of definitions really hides the fact that these two things are complex traits and we can't directly easily measure them. So that these are the kind of issues that we're facing and what I'll do is walk you through the issues involved and present some results from the project, which, which we see as encouraging and moving us towards applicability. So this is a, an organism that is living in a very harsh environment, um, high up on a piece of rock on a, on a ridge in the Corsican mountains. And I think we're all pretty much agreed that that is a robust organism. 
And for us, robustness is the capacity to carry on in poor environments. We don't really have a debate about that. We can, we can see that just by looking. If you ask farmers what their perception of a resilient cow is, they will tell you that she's a cow that never or rarely gets ill. She's a cow that has no problems getting back into calf. She's kind of the anonymous cow. She's in the herd. She does what you want her to do, but she doesn't draw attention to herself. And we've seen this in a number of farmer surveys, both those in the literature and those we've done in the project. Although farmers are not always clear about the difference between robustness and resilience, this is what they see as their real world perception. But there is a difference, and that difference is useful to us, as you'll see in the coming slides. So we talk about robustness, we talk about resilience. This picture, and I hope it comes up well on the screen, we have an oak tree, and this is in a sense the visual definition of robustness. It is a structure which is rigid, and when the wind blows, it doesn't really bend. Maybe a little bit, but not much. It resists. And that's the sort of the key underlying definition related to robustness. Of course, if the wind blows too hard, then at some point the oak tree will snap. So there is a limit to robustness. On the other hand, in the foreground at the bottom, there are some reeds or rushes. So these are plants which are very much more uh, a visualization of resilience, where every time the wind blows, the plant folds down and is out of the way. And then when the wind stops blowing, it pops back up again. So we have this notion of flexibility, of responding to a challenge and recovering quickly afterwards. So capacity to carry on in poor but stable environments is robustness. Capacity to respond to variable environments we call resilience. And the reason for defined separating these two elements clearly is because in different environments, you may have different needs for these two traits, these two components. So if we start off on this table, top left, a good and stable environment, you don't actually need very much resilience and robustness. And this is in fact what has happened with intensive farming. We've brought our animals indoors, we fed them high quality, highly digestible feeds, ad libitum. So this is a good and stable environment. And it's not surprising that having done that and selected animals in those environments, we've tended to select away from robust and resilient animals. If you go to the top right, so we're in a stable environment, but of poor quality, well, that's an environment in which you need to be robust. You need to find a way to carry on despite the poor conditions. Bottom left is a good environment, but it's highly variable. So there will be challenges, there will be changes in the environment. And this is where you need resilience. And this is the kind of scenario that is being talked about increasingly with climate change, more variable environments. The situation which is at the top right, the poor robustness environment, that's the kind of situation where we're saying, OK, we need to stop feeding ruminants those feed ingredients which can be digested by humans and have the ruminants feeding only on those which are not available to humans, so poor quality um, in nutrients. And of course, the two things can occur together, variable and poor environments, so ruminants grazing on marginal land um, and exposed to the elements, and there they need both resilience and robustness. So that's the kind of framework we, we're sitting in. I've avoided definitions because there are many of them, but you can't completely avoid them. The definition that we've put forward uh, in the paper in 2017 was the ability in the face of environmental constraints to carry on doing the various thing that the animal needs to do. And the reason an animal has robustness, at least in evolutionary terms, is so that it can survive and it can survive and then reproduce successfully. So we've added that in the definition. It's not a very snappy definition, it's long-winded, but it contains some important words. And that was the reason for capturing the, these terms. So we've talked about environmental constraints, and I just want to focus on one other element, the various things, because there is a fallacy in the robustness literature, which I think you should be aware of. When we talk about the various things, what we're saying is that 
uh, animals are not there just to produce milk. Just if that's what the farmer may wish, they are there, of course, to do a range of other life functions. Things like not only growth, pregnancy and lactation, but maintenance, immune function, behavioral adaptations and so on. All of those things which contribute to the robustness of the animal. When you look in the literature, you will find rather narrow robustness definitions. And these are there for a good reason, because if you have a tight robustness definition, then you can measure the components of that robustness. But given what we've just been saying, we would suggest that is not durable. So as a classical example of, a, of a, an experiment or a study to look at robustness is looking at a single trait. So on the y-axis here, you have milk yield. On the x-axis, you have environmental quality, and you measure the performance of your animals in different environments. And a highly robust animal in these terms is one that doesn't move very much, which has a shallow slope. Now, that's okay insofar as it goes, but that is the kind of animal that will at some point, if we push it far enough, have a collapse, an abrupt collapse, and maybe that's not what we want. But more importantly, this is a narrow definition. This is just focused on milk yields. If we imagine environmental quality to be decreasing nutrient supply, which is often the case, then as the nutrient supply decreases, if the animal maintains its milk yield, then it must be partitioning more and more resources to milk and less and less to the other life functions. So if we bring those into the picture, fertility, health, body reserves, they will be going down very fast. So in those terms, the animal would not be robust. So this is really to say, beware of very narrow robustness definitions. We think the single trait definitions are inadequate and we should be looking at multi-trait definitions. But that's not easy. That gives us a measurement issue. It means that we need to measure all of these different things. And that has been difficult until now, but is becoming more and more possible with the kind of technologies that are now coming on farm today. So I've defined robustness. I'm going to define a little bit resilience as well. Again, in simple terms, the ability to cope with environmental perturbations, to come through a perturbation, to live to find some other day. It implies the abilities of an animal to be able to absorb an environmental challenge. So we immediately think of body reserves, but it also implies adaptive strategies. Animals have behavioral strategies, animals can down prioritize certain life functions at difficult times and so on. In that context, resilience underpins robustness. So for an animal to carry on and and be able to get through for the oak tree to continue, it still has resilience at the level of the leaves and the branches. And in that sense, resilience should favour an increased productive longevity. And then we suggest that resilience can be deduced by looking at the rates of change in relevant measures when there is a perturbation. So an animal responds and then it recovers. The rates at which it does that should give us information on its resilience. This is an example of a, a perturbation, a confinement challenge in trout. And as you can see, for a range of different measures, there is a period before the challenge, then the gray box where there is the challenge and the animal responds, and then afterwards there's a recovery period. And the reason for showing this graph is that there are multiple elements here. There are behaviours, so things such as group activity, but there are also physiological measures such as cortisol production and oxygen consumption. And it's really a way of underlining the fact that these mechanisms are all dependent on underlying physiological mechanisms. So there are multiple ways in which an animal can respond. Bringing it a little closer to home, so we're now in ruminants, we're now in dairy goats. These are data from a two-day nutritional challenge. So along the x-axis you have time and at the beginning the animals are on a, a, a lactation TMR ad libitum. Then they have two days on straw only feeding and then they return to their TMR. Each line is an individual animal, so there are 16 goats here. 
And when you put animals on straw, it's no great surprise. Their intake goes down and it goes down to a fairly consistent point. What's interesting is when you start to look further downstream in the processes of the animal. So for example, in milk yield, we start to see more variability in the responses of different individuals. And even more so when we look at, for example, milk protein content. Here you can see there are some animals that don't respond at all and others that respond quite dramatically. And we've been able to drill down even further to go into specific milk metabolites. And I won't go into the details of this study. Uh, it should be coming out in the press uh, in not too distant future. But the point here is that with a range of milk metabolites in a multivariate analysis, we can cluster and identify three types of response amongst these 16 animals. So animals at the basic physiological level have different ways of coping with the same challenge. And this work that we're doing is looking quite promising because it is suggesting that we may be able to pick out some metabolites which would actually be biomarkers of their resilience response. So in standard control challenges, we can see the variabilities between individuals and their resilience, or rather, sorry, in their response and their recovery. We can cluster them into types and we begin to see ways of actually developing biomarkers. Obviously, we need larger studies than 16 goats to be able to say this definitely, and those studies are underway. But there are two issues raised by this study. The first is, can we apply this kind of thing outside of the lab? How would we measure resilience outside of the lab? And then the second element, which is, I'll come back to later, we've potentially found biomarkers of response and recovery. But are those really biomarkers of resilience? And you'll see in a bit, that's a fairly difficult question to address. Dealing with the question of application outside of the lab, the answer is yes. With the kind of data we get from precision livestock farming, we get time series data that are dense enough to allow us to identify naturally occurring perturbations. There's an example of this in the, in the graph here. So this is a milk yield curve for an individual animal uh, in a robotic milking situation. And you can see that we can fairly easily smooth that curve in two ways. One which represents what it would have done if it was not perturbed, and the other one, the blue one, which is picking out the perturbations. So mathematically, we can exploit naturally occurring perturbations, no problem. The question then is biologically, what do these fluctuations mean? If we compare two animals, one which had large uh, dips and one which had smaller dips, which one is the most resilient? In milk yield, you may begin to have an answer, but if you talk about something like responses in somatic cell counts, for example, is it better an animal that has a small response or an animal that has a large response? So these are the questions that we end up facing. We're stuck with this issue again, that we can't directly measure resilience. We have a fairly woolly definition, but what we want are operational, applicable measures. But we can't directly measure resilience. What we can measure are the accumulated consequences of resilience. If an animal is resilient, that should, all other things being equal, allow it to have a longer life. So an, an increased productive longevity. It allows it potentially then to also have an easier ability to recalve and to have fewer disease events. It has been resilient to the challenges thrown at it and therefore it does better. So if we can measure those accumulated consequences of resilience, we can use those as reference measures against which to test any ideas we have about particular resilience markers. And that's what I want to show you in the next few slides. The way in which we've approached identifying candidate resilience measures and putting them up against these reference measures, which are the accumulated consequences of a good resilience. To do that, there are three steps. The first thing we need to show is that what we pick as a reference measure, for example, productive longevity, is indeed impacted by resilience-related events. 
if we put up a, a measure such as productive longevity and the situation we're looking in there's no impact of health or reproduction or anything on that measure then we can pretty much be sure we're not looking at a situation where we can examine resilience then if we can show that we need to show the link between the resilience indicators that we're suggesting and the reference measures at population level. So are these, do these things generally apply across a large population? That of course helps us to prove that our measures are good, but it also allows us to look at the genetic component if there is one. And then the third step would be to drill down to farm level, because we know that obviously at different farms, there are different farming systems, different constraints and so on. So that would suggest you need to tailor how you manage animals according to different farm systems. So the first study I want to show you was tackling the first question. So this is a study that is coming out in Gentor shortly. Um, influence of production, reproduction, morphology and health traits on true and functional longevity in Austin cows. I'll just show you one example of the type of analyses. So these are survival analyses that are being done. And this basically calculates the relative risk of an animal being culled due to a particular category of effector that is being looked at. In this case, uh, numbers of test days with somatic cell counts of about 300,000 cells. So zero is the reference. So the relative risk there is one. And then as you increase the number of test day classes with cell counts of about 300,000, you can see that the relative risk of being culled increases. And interestingly, it increases for TL, so true longevity, that is longevity as is, not adjusted for anything. But it also increases for functional longevity, which is the longevity which has been adjusted for differences in milk yield. So, number of health events increases risk of cull even for after you've adjusted for milk yield. Conclusions of that study were that there were significant impacts of both fertility and health traits on longevity. It's not necessarily surprising, but it tells us that we can build resilience reference measures based on fertility and health and longevity. There was a strong influence of milk production level on this relative risk of culling. So if we want to look at resilience, we should adjust for milk production level. And in that sense, the functional longevity is probably a better proxy for resilience per se. But the true longevity is interesting because it would include the trade-off between resilience and production if there is one. Using this, we could then go a step further, and this is work now being presented, which is from Marika Popper and the group at Wageningen, who looked at the variation in deviations from the lactation curve as resilience indicators, and were able to get hold of a quite unique data set to do it. So what Marika has done is to, is to have a, a data set with several hundred thousand animals from robotic milking systems in the Netherlands, to be able to fit the lactation curve, so that's the panel A at the top, and then to extract from that lactation curve all the deviations relative to the fit, that's the panel at the bottom. And that allows her to calculate the variation in these deviations. And what she's then been able to show is the genetic correlations between that variance in milk yield and functional traits that were recorded for those animals after adjustment for milk yield level. And what you can see in the table is that there are negative correlations between this variance in milk yield and the health traits and also longevity and fertility. So basically, the more variable is the milk production curve, the poorer is the health, the shorter longevity, and to some extent, the poorer fertility. And this has been published in Journal of Dairy Science. So we have already a marker that can be measured in large populations and which allows us to identify animals potentially that are more or less resilient. What Marika also showed in the subsequent piece of work was that there was a significantly large variance between different herd years. So there are herds 
which have a much, much smaller variance on average than other herds. And that suggests strongly that there are herd level effects which are important. So we've looked at that as well. This is a study by Ines Adriens, who's at the uh, University of Leuven, uh, in conjunction with uh, partners in uh, the UK and Wageningen as well. Looking at uh, productive lifespan and resilience rank on a farm basis. So she had a data set with 27 farms in total. Uh, the 27 farms all had to have daily milk records as well as reasonable records of uh, culling and reproduction. And she had a subset of data where there was also activity data available from accelerometers. The approach that was taken here was to calculate for each animal a resilience rank. So this is a, a way of building a reference measure that can be used whilst the animal is still alive. So for example, from first lactation to predict what might be happening in second lactation and so on. And the score is basically calculated by saying the higher the number of lactations an animal has been able to achieve, the greater is her score. And that is adjusted for her milk yield relative to herd mates and also for calving in uh, interval, beg your pardon, not indexed, relative to herd mates and so on. And once you had that resilience rank, this could then be compared with the sensor features she was looking at. So she looked at 30 different sensor features from the milk yield curve and 15 from the activity measures. So just to give you an idea of what that resilience rank looks like, this graph is showing the lifetime resilience score for 110 animals from a particular farm. The y-axis is the lactation number they were in when they were culled. And you can see that as the lactation number goes up, the resilience rank goes up. Although there are some animals, for example, in the, the fourth lactation, which actually have a poorer resilience than some in third lactation, presumably because they did not have very good reproduction and health, whereas the ones in third lactation were very good on those characteristics. But basically it allows us to give animals this resilience rank. Then she extracted uh, data from uh, features from the activity data. So you can see here uh, daily activity being smoothed in three different ways to get out the short term changes and to get out the longer term time trends. She did similar things to Marika for the milk yield curve to get out features from the milk yield data and then look to see whether these sensor features correlated strongly with the resilience ranking. So the sensor features were significant predictors of resilience rank with features both from milk and activity. However, the panel of features which was significant on one farm was not the same as the panel which was significantly predictive on another farm. So there are large farm to farm differences in predictors. You can see that in this graph here, which on the x-axis has a range of sensor features, and on the y-axis is showing the correlation of that particular sensor feature to the resilience rank, and each line is a different farm. So you can see clearly that there's a variability from farm to farm in which are the ones that correlate positively with the resilience ranking. So that suggests not that animals are different on different farms, but rather the, the production context, the environment is different. So if you think back to what we were talking about in the beginning, about different environments needing different levels of resilience, well, that's perhaps partly what's being reflected here, along with the farm management decisions. Farmers' decisions on when to keep an animal, when to breed her, when to color vary from farm to farm, and that would also impact this. But it suggests that if we have these resilience indicators, they will need to be applied in different ways in farm management. So if I want to sum up for the resilience part, I would say that we have moved towards operational resilience measures that impact productive longevity, that impact frequency of health and reproductive events. And then you could say, so what? What is the real value of resilience? And 
Certainly, there are studies that are beginning to look at that in terms of economics. What I want to do is to make the link between resilience and efficiency, because we've become increasingly interested as we've moved through Gen 12 in talking about sustainable efficiency. And I think I've jumped to the wrong place. Excuse me, I just need to go back. And I'm not sure what I've done there. Completely jumped out. Sorry for the slip. Okay. So do you have this on screen now? Jean-Baptiste? Not, not yet. Okay, so I even broke the sharing. Sorry about that. Um, but now you should see the slide we were at before. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll try and hit the right button this time. So, um, typically, we achieve gains in efficiency by dilution of maintenance. That has been the major increase in efficiency over the last 50 years. So we get animals to produce more, and thereby the part of the their intake which goes to functions. But a question which is frequently ignored or even forgotten is over what time period do we measure that efficiency? Traditionally, we've measured over the shortest period possible in order to get a credible measure because measuring intake is expensive, as I guess you all know, um, and is very rarely done outside of uh, research farms. But that then completely ignores the consequence of what dilution and maintenance does for long-term efficiency if we were to measure efficiency on a much longer scale. So if we take an animal which has an intake, a nutrient supply, and then it comes to the nutrient partition, the more it pushes to the left to production, the greater its efficiency. So that is the classical dilution of maintenance efficiency. Obviously, the more you push to production, the less is going to the other life functions on the right. And we know now clearly that that impacts the risk of disease of the animal, that increases its frequency of reproductive problems. So these are things which impact its welfare, its robustness and its longevity. And the reason there's an arrow between that box, robustness and longevity and efficiency, is because we can look at efficiency another way. We can look at it in terms of dilution of non-productive lifespan. So a cow that makes it to first lactation, but then fails early in first lactation, is incredibly inefficient because all of the feed that went into her non-productive lifespan, getting from being a calf to becoming an, uh, a heifer, has only been diluted by a very, very small amount of milk. If we want to improve efficiency on this scale, we want animals with long productive lifespans. The longer the productive lifespan, the more that dilutes out the costs that were incurred of growing that animal. So we have these two notions of efficiency, short term and long term. And the way it's set up in this figure, it seems as if those two things are in opposition. If you want efficiency, you reduce resilience and thereby you, if you go for the dilution of maintenance, you will have a, um, an opposition between efficiency and resilience. On the other hand, if you look at efficiency in the long term, so dilution of non-productive lifespan, you need the resilience in order to get a good efficiency. So then efficiency and resilience become positively correlated. So that is what we would say in theory. And indeed, we define sustainable efficiency as being the classic ratio of energy and product to energy invested, but measured over a time period that is sufficiently long as to allow us to ensure that all the negative consequences of our potential high milk production are included. The question is, can we show this in practice? And the difficulty here is there are almost no data because this would imply having experiments where the intake of the animals has been measured pretty much throughout their lifespan for a large enough number of animals to be able to calculate long-term efficiency and incorporate the effects on health and reproduction and so on. 
We're trying to build those data sets, but even in a five-year project like Gentle, you can only scratch the surface. What we can do, though, is to resort to modeling. So we use predictive modeling to explore resilience and efficiency. And I just want to show you very quickly a helicopter view of a particular model developed by a colleague in our unit last few years, which shows the extent to which different definitions of efficiency um, maybe are impacting this resilience part. So very, very quickly, she has a model which is based on allowing the animal to allocate its resources to different life functions. And the model also includes the ability of the animal to acquire resources. The important thing in this graph is you can see that this means that we can predict intake and we predict all the outcomes for the animal, milk, body reserves, probability of conception, whether or not she survives, maintenance cover, and so on. This has been applied to dairy cows. There are two publications in the Journal of Dairy Science concerning this model. And what you get is these kinds of profiles. So this is a very long-lived animal, but you can see the profile of body weight for this animal with all the different components. And over on the left, you can see that the things that define those animals are kind of genetic parameters for how much it can acquire and where it puts its different resources, where it allocates them. If you have all those outputs, then you can calculate efficiency. And this is what Laurence did on the short term, so calculating it for second lactation, but also in the long term, calculating it for the same animals, but over the whole lifespan. And then what she did was she simulated animals which had different values for the allocation of energy resources to growth or to lactation and different values for how much energy they could basically acquire or can they acquire additionally in lactation. And here we're looking at the results of this sensitivity analysis for short term efficiency. And as you'll see in the top right, the thing that may has a major effect on increasing short term efficiency is how much resource you allocate to lactation. That's not surprising. That's what we would classically say from dilution of maintenance. What's interesting though here is the amount of resources the cow acquires in lactation has very little effect. So it's all to do with how much they partition. And for these exact same values, for these exact same simulation results, if we now simply change the calculation and calculate for the whole lifespan of the animal, this is what we get. So now the allocation to lactation, which is at the top right, has very little effect on the long-term efficiency of the animals. What becomes important now is the acquisition in lactation and to some extent, the allocation to growth. So just simply changing the time span over which we calculate efficiency reveals different underlying capacities which are important. And the reason for this is because these two elements, they impact the body reserves the animal has, and they impact then the probability of conception and the probability of being culled, so the longevity of the animal. And we've taken this a step further in the latest publication, looking at how different environments impact different individuals. So this is just a quick flash graph to show you that different types of animals are, are identified as being the best, depending upon the environment in which we raise those animals. So in conclusion, we now have the modeling tools that allow us to ask questions about optimizing efficiency and resilience from a time-related perspective, and to begin to say how these will be different in different local production environments. So Gentle is putting down the bricks, which we then are hoping will be picked up and turned into practical tools, which can be used by breeders, can be used by advisors and by farmers. I've whizzed through all of these different studies done by these young scientists. Um, there is more information. If you go to the website or to the Gentle YouTube, you'll find videos from each of these different uh, authors presenting in more detail these studies, and it would do them justice to, to go and see those rather than just get my two-minute summary. And with that, 
I thank you for your attention and would be happy to discuss.